So I want to talk about what it means to try to take a serious, critical, bifocal perspective into policy. I want to reflect a bit on my role as an expert witness in court cases. Um, for in, I've been involved in almost two dozen high-profile class action lawsuits about educational injustice, where I'm given the rare opportunity to gather narrative and quantitative material from a wide range of children, usually children in poverty, who have been miseducated, excluded from opportunity, misrecognized, and betrayed by the public sector in hopes that I can theorize this material and tell a different story than the one that is being told about these young people. Often when I enter courtrooms, and I'll give you some examples, I, I feel like I'm in a very delicate traffic jam between terrifying neoliberal reform and radical possibilities, to quote from our friend Jean Anion. Um, critical bifocality in my backpack, I smuggle in histories, stories of history, structure, so that, it's, so that we're not fetishizing these disparities like, why are there more discipline problems with black kids than white kids? Why do they have lower test scores, black kids and white kids? Why do they, um, would finance equity really make a difference given how poor they are? Those are the kinds of cases I'm involved in. And if you just stay on the downstream indicator of disparity, it's over. You need to introduce more about history, more about structure, more about the accumulation of dispossession. And that's partly what I try to do in court. I've testified in the Citadel case where young women were suing to gain access to a public all-male military academy in South Carolina. Happy to talk about any of this. Um, I maybe shouldn't have done that one. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's actually really interesting when you're fighting for access into institutions that refuse to transform. Let me just put that as a thought bubble for all of you. I have fought for access for kids of color to get into historically white schools, girls to get into boys' schools. A and I worry because lawyers aren't actually very interested in making an argument about transformation. They want to argue a kind of neoliberal access, assimilation, just let them in. Nothing has to change except for maybe you'll buy a Tampex machine at the Citadel, right? And, and if you have to kind of contain the more radical imagination for transformation, you, you might be inviting young people into institutions where they're going to be surrounded by what some would call structural violence in the name of civil rights. So I want to, let me start with my concluding dystopic idea. Um, I was involved in the case in Wadawi, Alabama, where the principal canceled the prom because of biracial dating. I don't know if you remember that. You probably mostly weren't born, but um, <laughs> a young woman, white woman, was dating a black kid. Her mother called the principal, Hewland Humphreys, and said, can you talk to Sherry because she's dating a black kid and you know, we're really worried. And Hewland Humphreys was thrilled to talk to Sherry. He called her into the office and he said, Sherry, you shouldn't date him because <coughs> your children won't be very smart. You won't be invited to family reunions and no white boy's ever going to want you. And she said, I don't ever want a white boy. She walked out. He then invited all of the kids into the auditorium where he said, I won't tolerate mixed race dating. And then he called on Shawanda, a biracial young woman, and said, who are you taking to the prom? And she said, Chris, white boyfriend. And he said, I won't tolerate mixed race dating. You were a problem, and you were a mistake, and we won't have any more mistakes. Shawanda, no fool, found her way to the Southern Poverty Law Center, got her college tuition paid for. Um, and the black families and mixed race families in the community set up freedom school. So I rode down on a horse with the uh, Justice Department. And it, it's, um, it's actually an amazing story. I'm happy to give you more details. I was also an expert witness in Williams v. California. I got to work with Jeannie Oakes and uh, Linda Darling Hammond. And it's a case that basically boils down to low-income kids get to go to highly under-resourced schools. Jeannie looked at, um, I think, teacher qualifications. Uh, Linda looked at teacher qualifications, and Jeannie looked at facilities, and somebody else looked at finance. And I was the social psychologist asked to document 
how all of these conditions produce educational inequity, kind of connecting the dots between dead rats in the swimming pool and school dropout, which is kind of social psychological magic. Um, and I, I was most recently involved in a case called Reed v. California, documenting the impact of what it means to attend schools with 40 to 60 percent long-term subs. Um, and I've been involved in two new cases, one of which I will go into, in which civil rights lawyers are convinced that poor children are being denied instructional time, inadequate amounts of extra learning time. I'm sure you dealt with this at Spencer. We've all heard about grants for extra learning time because of lockdown, school violence, immigration raids, high teacher turnovers, illness, lice, buildings falling apart in low-income schools. I've testified about the academic and racial consequences of high-stakes testing and why excluding girls from the Citadel is not only bad for the girls, but really bad for the boys. Um, and if I get a chance, I I've gotten tripped up in some cases where I didn't realize the case was nested in a larger neoliberal commitment to privatize public education. It's one of the risks one runs by joining these lawsuits that any critique of public education runs the risk of being appropriated by privatizers. I don't need to tell you this in Wisconsin, but it keeps us in a very funny bind that if you critique, you run the risk of being appropriated. So these long-term subcases, the day after I testified, we won. Uh, I can't explain the details, take too long. But the headline was Villa Rosa saying first nail in the coffin of tenure cases. And I had spent a lot of time with lawyers and journalists saying, no, 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 this was a case about equity and tenure being highly compatible, sacred commitments, not one against the other. But you never know whose um, theater you're dancing in. <laughs>